All right, welcome to our first session in the book of Romans. We're going to do an introduction to the book of Romans. We're going to accomplish two things in doing that introduction. First thing we're going to do is we're going to establish the doctrinal position of the book of Romans. What that means, you will see in just a moment. And secondly, I'm going to give you a general outline of the book so you'll have an idea of how we're headed through the book. This book, there, there are a thousand ways to do an outline of the book of Romans. And I'm going to give you an outline that I think is very, very beneficial to getting a better understanding of the book of Romans. Now, I'm going to do what I did in the book of Acts, and that is I'm going to use principles to be able to explain the, the most important points of this study. So let me give you the first principle right off the bat, and here it is. God has given us the books in our Bible in a specific order that are doctrinally progressive. You remember we saw progressive revelation as we were studying in the book of Acts earlier, and now we see this. Now what that means is, as you come through your Bible, starting with Genesis here, you come on over here, you got Malachi at the end, and then you come across those blank pages to Matthew, and then you get to the book of Acts, and then you have Romans, and then you have the next book is 1 Corinthians. I don't need to go any further because this will illustrate the point. Romans, sorry, Romans, that's catchy, isn't it? Uh, never mind. Romans is placed in your Bible in the exact spot that God means for you to encounter it as you study your Bible in a biblical theology. That means we start at the beginning and we work our way through. And when you get to Romans, it's in the exact spot. Look, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's just you know, put them all as the Gospels here. What happens after the last thing in the Gospels is the death of Jesus on the cross. It does show his burial in the tomb, his resurrection from the dead. You don't get a lot of details about what happens after that, except a statement where Jesus says, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth, go into all nations and preach the gospel. Remember that kind of business. Now, that's what happens here. Then when you come to Acts, which is the next book, you know what that does? That takes up in the 40 days after his resurrection, where Jesus is speaking to them uh, concerning the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, tarry you at Jerusalem until you be endued with power, you know, the promise of the Father, and then he ascends up into heaven, and then the angels, you know, say, this same Jesus will so come in like manner. They go into Jerusalem, remember, 10 days later is the day of Pentecost, you're in Acts chapter 2, and you start coming through the historical record of the book of Acts so that you see the things that are happening there. They preach, thousands get saved. There's three opportunities. The nation and their leaders are given to repent and receive Jesus as their Messiah. And even though some people, can you hear that? You hear that now? Even though some people get, get that and they receive Jesus as their Messiah, the nation at large does not. The leaders reject that. There's the stoning of Stephen, the last opportunity to repent and change their mind about Jesus. And then Paul gets saved. You see, this is a historical account of a progression of events. And then after you get that historical record that takes you through Paul's apostolic journeys, ending the book of Acts with his imprisonment at Rome, it is at Rome that he begins to write those other epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and uh, pastoral epistles. The next book you encounter after the account of all that is the, is the book of Romans, which is the logical book to come on the heels of that historical account. Why? Because Romans is the foundational doctrine given to you and me living in the dispensation of grace to build our edification. That's a big word, and we're going to define it in just a minute. That is the beginning. It's the first things first. It's the primer. It's, 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 it's like laying the foundation, and all the rest of the edification that's going to come your way is going to be built on that foundation. We understand the building, right? Okay. Now, The verse that I want to give you is in Romans 1, and it's going to talk about why he is writing the book of Romans. He's going to tell them. By the way, it comes before 1 Corinthians on purpose. 
I'm going to show you a little bit of that purpose, but more as we go through the book and we'll get to examine these things. What I'm trying to tell you is by this principle is that every book in your Bible is in there, in the order it's in, for the reason of layering on this additional information and building your knowledge in the Word. Romans is perfectly placed. I saw an ad the other day that said, Chronological Bible. Here is a Bible with the books arranged in the order in which they were written, which would make the book of Job the first book in your Bible. Now, does God want us to know them in chronological order? No. They have been arranged in the order they're in in your Bible for the reason of your edification. Now, 1 Corinthians takes the doctrine back here in Romans and builds on that doctrine. 2 Corinthians takes what's in these two and builds on that. And then Galatians completes this formative foundational doctrine. When you, we don't do foundations the way they used to in the old days. When we get to the outline, you'll see how they did that because I'm going to use that as a way of illustrating it. But now what we do is pour a slab. But you don't just go out and pour concrete on the ground. What you have to do is you have to dig footers because the outside of the building that holds the weight of the building has to have more concrete in it. So you dig footers down, just ditches. And, and then you have to put up batter boards around because the top of the concrete is going to come up to a place and you need to be able to get that level and you take, you take something across those boards that screets the concrete. You, know, you come across, you level that concrete out and, and you get it all right. And, and the top of those boards, they're all supposed to be level so that you can you, you know, get that concrete poured in there level. And the footers, that's, there's a whole lot of things you do before you can ever just come in and start pouring concrete. Uh, structural integrity through wire or rebar, you know, you put that stuff in there and the concrete goes around it and that, that gives it more, more strength and you, you know all that kind of stuff. Okay, the thing I'm saying is when you're laying a foundation in, in, this, in, in your edification, it's more than just, okay, God, I'm saved, so I guess now I know everything there is to know. You know that's not how it works. It would be nice if God would have opened up our head, poured it all in, and closed us up. That would have been great. However, he chose to do it a different way for a purpose, and the first thing he gives us is this book, Romans. I'm going to tell you this now. If you don't get Romans right, if the foundation is tilted, everything you build on it is only going to accentuate the error. If you don't get Romans right, the stuff in Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians is not going to be right either. So that's why we're going to use Romans. We're going to take our time, and I'm going to teach you the book of Romans because this is valuable. Okay, principle number two. Each book in our Bible has a specific function focusing upon doctrine, reproof, or correction. Now, the reason I said it to you like that is I actually added to this principle. I was just going to give you like this. Each book in your Bible has a specific function. It's very important for you to understand what that function is. I think I have a verse to give you with that. Let me see. No, I didn't. Do you remember that verse in, in, uh, in, in Timothy? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for. What's the first thing? Well, the first one in the list, doctrine is the first one. Next one, reproof, correction, and instruction. That's what the one Doc was talking about, in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's the verse in 316. Now, the first thing he says is doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Every one of Paul's epistles have a focus that comes out of that verse. Romans, Romans is a book of doctrine. No one's getting corrected in the book of Romans. Do you know why? They don't know anything to be corrected over. They haven't even received the doctrine yet. So Romans is a book of doctrine. When you get to 1 Corinthians, however, it is a book of reproof. 
First and second Corinthians. Then when you get to Galatians, Galatians is a book of correction. The next book that comes after that is Ephesians. And what you're going to find is Ephesians is a book of doctrine. But now you get the advanced doctrine. Does that make sense to you? So every book in your Bible, the Bible itself tells us, the Word of God, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, and it gives you these choices. You say, well, what about instruction in righteousness? Every book is in instruction in righteousness. All the books are instruction in righteousness. But some of the books focus on things. And Romans is a book that focuses on doctrine. So we're going to learn the doctrine. Corinthians, they get reproved because they're not walking according to what they know from the doctrine they are supposed to conduct themselves by. They're not doing that. So they get reproved. The Galatians, it's not that they're not walking according to it. They got removed from the truth and went back to the law. So they get corrected. Reproof is you're wrong. You get yourself straight. Correction is, you know what? You're off course. Let's get you back on course. So there's a little bit of difference between reproof and correction. Again, we'll talk about those things later on. I do want to show you this verse in Romans, though, where Paul tells them the reason he's writing the book of Romans. Here it is in verse 11. For I long to see you so that we may have fellowship and go to that nice steakhouse down the road from your church. No. I long to see you that, here's the reason, I may impart, impart unto you some spiritual it, gift to the end, what does that mean? For the purpose, right? To the end, ye may be established. This is the reason for the book of Romans. He said, in fact, he's going to tell them in the book of Romans, the reason I'm going ahead and writing this is because I've tried several times to come and see you to tell you these things, but I've been prohibited from doing that. Now I'm writing it to you. So Romans is the establishment book. To the end, you may be established. When we got saved, the first thing that should have been done for all of us was to put us in the book of Romans and teach us that book. Let me ask you a question. How many people after you got saved, let's say within the first year of your conversion, were taken through and instructed in the 16 chapters in the book of Romans? Let me see your hands. I'm going to tell you, in my life, I've known lots of people. Pastor in churches, I've known lots of people. I have never known anyone that has been instructed in the book of Romans following their salvation. Let me tell you why. Because we preachers didn't know to do that. In fact, here's what was taught to me in school. Get a new convert in the book of John. Really? If you listen to my old tapes, I did a little better than that. Not much. I said, put them in 1 Thessalonians. I had what I thought was a pretty good reason, not God's reason. God put this book first for a reason. I, look, I, these principles to you, look, I'm saying them to you. All the books are in there in the order they're supposed to be, and you're going, yeah, I know, I know, we've kind of talked about that. But you understand that when I first discovered that, that was a revelation. I didn't realize that. When I say to you, every book has a specific purpose in here. It's directed with a focus. I didn't get that when I was a young preacher boy. They didn't teach me that in school. So the whole hum stuff we do here, when I heard it, was like bells and whistles going off. So, when this, so this, Romans, is the establishment epistle. It is the thing that God is doing. Okay. Um, and God is giving them this establishment because of this word. Their edification. 
Now, I told you we'd get to this big word, and we are. That's not a word that people use too much. And you know what really surprises me is? When I use that word, when I'm praying or preaching, depending on where I am. Now, you folks have heard me enough that you just know I'm, you know, a little bit, you know, off the, you know, you know. Don't say it out loud. It'll hurt my feelings. But when I'm out somewhere else and I use that word, people look at me funny. When I pray, Lord, I pray for the edification of these people, they're all looking at me like he wants what to happen to us? Or if you say it in a sermon, I'm saying this for your edification, they're going, why don't you just say for our information? Because edification is not just information. Edification is something else, and I want to describe to you what that is. The root word of edification is edifice. That's the noun. I know edify, but edify is not a noun. Edifice. You know what an edifice is? What, what's an edifice? It's a building. When we look at a, a, a building, we go, look at that. Have you ever said, look at that edifice? I know you don't talk like that. Okay, you go, look at that building. All right. It's an edifice, okay? Here's what God is doing in us, and this is what the book of Romans is laying the slab for. God is building a building of doctrine in every one of us, and we are supposed to live in and out of this building to conduct the everyday affairs of our lives. Why? Because that doctrine is meant to tell us things that are not specifically said in the Bible. If I was up in Decatur waiting for a verse in the Bible to say, Mike, move to Monahans, I would never get moved. Why? There is no verse. What am I supposed to make a decision out of? Well, you know, let's don't get into that thing because now, you know, we do all this other stuff. God, now if you want me to move to Monahans, and then we start, you know, asking for the fleece to be wet or dry, right? Instead, God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a building in you, in your soul. And in this building, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to lay a foundation. That's Romans. That's the foundation of the edifice that's being built in you. And your edification is the building of this building. When I was, you know, I preach this to Billy before it ever comes here, so that if something doesn't click just right, or she gives me that look like, what? I know, I got to explain that better. Your edification, I say it's a building of doctrine. She said, of information. Well, that's, and doctrine is information. It is specific information. We're, God is building a building of things in you so that you can operate. Now, people, when you say the word doctrine, instantly their eyes glaze over, their mind short circuits, their eyelids close, they're, they're done, right? People hate doctrine. Look, can I just do an aside for a moment? I am doing a study now on the bare bones stuff, not for the Institute, that is about personal tribulation. The way we are supposed to view and respond to the adverse circumstances that happen in our life. The Bible says that every bad thing that happens to you falls under one of three categories and it lists them by name. And your response, and actually the doctrine that is given to you is a little different for each one of those. Now that kind of makes sense because if we know there are, if the, if the lights go out, we know it could be a bulb. It could be a breaker. It could be someone ran over a pole and the power just went out. In these lights, it could be that little ballast up there and the lights just aren't coming on. But there's a lot of different things. When you identify what it is, the solution is something different for each one of those, isn't it? 
But when bad things happen to you in your life, you have to identify which one of these categories it falls under. And then once you understand which category, there is doctrine that is given to you specifically to address that category of sufferings. Here's the thing that, and, and, and this is why I'm telling it to you, not to promote that work, but to say this to you. That's how important the doctrine is. People go, I, don't give me doctrine. If you preach doctrine at that church, I don't want to go hear it. That is the way God has determined for you to get through your everyday life is by applying and knowing the doctrine. Does that make sense to you? If you don't know what to do, how in the world can you do it? So you know what people do? Christians suffer immeasurably when they shouldn't have to because they don't know what the doctrine is about the, the bad circumstances of life. Now, I know we've never talked about those things here. And the reason I would say that, to, I'm saying it's not because I didn't want you to know it, is because every time I preach a sermon, there are a million things that could go along with that sermon, and you have to pick and choose what you're going to do in 45 minutes. When I say to you, this thing that we're studying about the Bible, there's a lot to it. There is no words in my vocabulary to describe to you how much work we have to do. There is no way for me to... I, I'm just... I'm just saying, every time I turn around, there is a huge issue here that just is not being taught to the body of Christ. We just, you know, and so we're working our way through it. We're working our way through it. It makes sense for us to do Romans because Romans is the foundational doctrine. It's the establishment doctrine. It's the first thing that goes down to build this edifice, this building. But doctrine is important, and I was using that illustration to say, in your everyday life, if someone runs into you as you pull out of the parking lot and you get whiplash and you're down in your back for the next six weeks, that particular suffering falls under one of those categories. If you get sick, that suffering falls under one of those categories. If Satan tries to shut you down, that suffering falls under one of those categories. When you slam your finger in the car door, that suffering falls under one of those categories. But it's the doctrine that tells us that. It's the doctrine that tells us the problem is it's the bulb. And here's what you do to fix it. The problem is it's the breaker. And here's what you do to fix it. And, when th and people always want to know, well, you know what? You talk about all that doctrine, but that doesn't do me any good in my life. The only thing that does you good in your life is the doctrine. There, Satan's desire is for us to get the substitutes for the doctrine. He wants us to counter. He is going to counterfeit the doctrine. And what he wants to do is get something, not that doesn't work at all, but it just works a little, and that's sufficient. What God wants you to do when you have a problem is not go to the psychiatrist who is darkening counsel by words without wisdom. What he wants you to do is to understand the process that's going on in you and your edification because the answer is there. I'm not doing pop psychology here. That's another counterfeit. When things are... <clears throat> When things are happening to you, something happens in your soul. Your body, your soul, and your spirit are connected. You do understand that. Look, when you're afraid, when you're really afraid, when you start to pick up a pen and sign your name, what happens? You, it's hard to sign your name. Your body isn't afraid. It's your soul, the seat of your emotions. But it's connected to your body. So things are happening in your body because of that. Look, our little grandson, when we bought him a train for his birthday, we set it up on the table and turned it on, and it was motoring around. He had never seen anything like that. And instantly, his little legs went, just like that. That's what he did. He did that all the way around the table. Now, he didn't go, you know, I am so happy. What can I do to express my happiness? Maybe I I will move my legs fast. <laughs> no, you know what that was? That was the natural response of the body because of his little soul experiencing that emotion. It happens in kids and it happens in adults. 
That's why sometimes, you know, something you see something, you can't help but smile. Your body is, you didn't think, oh, you know what? I see that. I like that. I shall smile now. It, you don't have to figure it out. It just happens. Well, what I'm telling you is there's some, just as you're, you can see, you can see the connection between the body and the soul, there is another connection between the soul and the spirit. And what is supposed to happen is this building of edification, this building of doctrine, is, gets built up in you so that when you encounter the things in your everyday life, you don't run to the self-help book, which may give you some measure of, of, of comfort or answer, and so you think that's it. That is a cheap counterfeit. What you do is you, your, your soul cries out to your spirit for the answer. And if there's no edification, the spirit sends back the message, I don't have anything. And the soul begins to look somewhere else for the answer. Here was the answer. Here was the answer. There hath no temptation that's come upon you but such as is common to man. We lose a loved one. Are we the first one? We suffer financial difficulty. Are we the first one? We have a disease. Are we the first one? We, we have a calamity. We lose, we lose money. We lose possession. Is that the, are we the first ones? Are you kidding? D is God surprised by these? Oh, my goodness. Well, I didn't count on that. I don't have anything for you. Really? That's what this age is about, folks. This stuff is what this age is about. It's not about the, 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 the fleshly, physical things of the world. It's about the spiritual part of us inside. That's what this age is about. And God says, let me build this building in you. <coughs> and God says, I'm going to use Romans, and I'm going to lay a slab. And now I'm going to come around with Corinthians and Galatians, and we're going to dress that slab up just right. And then I'm going to come to Ephesians, and I'm going to build a building on top of that. Well, we're going to get to it, so I guess we'll just, we'll just get to it. Wow, I'm sure I'm out of time. Thank you for that, Mike. That was great. Okay. The edification is the building process that is taking place in our souls. And the reason I took all that time was to tell you it's not just about well, I, you know, see, people today don't want to study the Bible. They don't care about studying the Bible. They think if they come here, all we're going to do is just study the Bible. What you understand is, they, they say, I want something practical. I want something practical. You can't get more practical than the doctrine that builds that building. That's what you're going to live out of. Oh, thanks, Patricia. That's great. Patricia's the only one that loves me. I don't understand it. Kidding, honey. <laughs> well, no, it wasn't Dr. Pepper, so it wasn't the company. Okay. Thank you, Teresa. Okay, now, <clears throat> that doesn't get any more practical. But here's the thing. What I'm trying to show you it is practical. It is the only really practical thing that there is. Everything else is a counterfeit of the edification that's supposed to be taking place in us. Look, if you do this edification process, you, you have been brought unto perfection. Doesn't mean you never do anything wrong. That's not how the Bible uses that word. It means you have reached a level of maturity with regard to the doctrine. It's a process, and you have to learn it, so it takes some effort. The problem with the church at Corinth was they were carnal. That's the word Paul used. And because they were carnal, one of the first evidences of carnality is lack of Bible study. 
You don't care about learning the Bible. Now, the fact that you're here, you do understand. You're sitting in seats that some people, you couldn't tie them to these seats. I'm not, I'm not trying to say if you don't come here, you're carnal. I'm saying if you don't want to know this word, that is a hallmark sign of carnality. That is what I am saying. So the Corinthians were in that boat. So they had problems with their daily walk matching who Romans said they had been created to be in Christ Jesus. They didn't want to walk like that. They wanted to walk out of step with that, so they got the reproof to get them back in step. Okay. Those three categories, ah, let me back up. Those three, doctrine, reproof, and correction, are the main focus of every, uh, one of those is the main focus of every book that Paul wrote to you. Romans is the book for doctrine. I showed you that. Okay, so just kind of reminding you about that. Now, this build, okay, here's the principle number three. Sorry. Oh, well, there is that verse. You know, I did have it in there. Just because it wasn't in the order I thought it ought to be in, I didn't have it. All scripture, scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for. The first thing is doctrine. That's what we gave you. The second thing is reproof. The next one is correction. And the next one is instruction and righteousness. And, and, and that the man of God may be what? Perfect. I'm not talking about without sin. I mean, God's not tickled about it when we do, but that's not the issue here. The issue is not sinlessness. The issue is about being truly furnished unto all good works. We only know that when this doctrine is in you, when this, when this house of doctrine is built. Okay, now I think I get to take you to principle three. There are two ways in which our edification is described in Paul's epistles. By use of building terminology and growth terminology. Let me give you some of the building terminology. Sorry, there it is. I just gave it to you. I don't know why I did that again. 1 Corinthians 3.10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, this is Paul writing, as a wise what? Master builder. That's a building term, isn't it? A wise master builder. And then look what Paul says. I have, he's saying this at 1 Corinthians, I have laid the foundation. That's the Romans doctrine. I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Paul says, I've given you all the foundational doctrine and now you're going to be building on that. Be careful how you do that. Why, is he, why doesn't he just say, all right, here's a test to see if you're listening in the last hour. Why doesn't he just say, Build on it according to what I have given you in the book of Ephesians. Huh? That's right, because this is 1 Corinthians. Not even Paul knows the Ephesians doctrine yet. So now, you know what he said? I gave you the foundation. Take heed how you build on it. That makes perfect sense. But I want you to notice the terminology. That's really what we're after. A wise master builder, a foundation, he that buildeth. He's using, he's constructing an edifice. That's the terminology that's being used. This thing is being built up within us, and that's exactly what Paul is doing. Now, the growth terminology. Growth terminology is also used in Paul's epistles because we are growing up in Christ, you understand. So let me show these to you. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto... A what? Perfect man. Till we all come unto a perfect man. What I'm telling you again is perfect is not talking about sinless. I'll never do anything wrong again. He's talking about a level of maturity because he's going to define it to you in the next phrase. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The stature of the fullness of Christ. Where, where do we find that? We find that in the meat epistles of Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. By the way, look where this is written. Book of Ephesians. 
He's talking about the fullness of Christ now. Now we're going to complete the, we're going to complete the building. We're going to get the building up on the foundation that we laid earlier. Here's the next one. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto, here's that growth terminology, babes in Christ. It was growth terminology before about becoming a perfect man, the stature of the fullness of Christ. Here is babes in Christ. Here's the next one. Ephesians 6, 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's growth. That, that's things you do with children. It has to do with a growth process, nurturing them, okay, bringing, and bringing them up, okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 2. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither yet are you now able. So you understand, he says, with a baby, you get a new baby comes in the world, you give it milk. You don't give it steak, hamburger, it's not able to digest it. Well, he's using that same terminology to talk about their spiritual growth. He says, your babes, and by the way, this, look at this indictment against them here. I'll just bring it out. He said, hitherto you're not able to bear it. He said, before when I was with you, you were not able to bear it. You couldn't get meat. And he says, and you're not able to have meat now. So that's why he's writing to chew them out. It's the reproof that's going on. Okay, here's the next one. Ephesians 4.14. That we henceforth be no more children. Look what, the, what happens to children. Tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. When you are children in your understanding, you are blown about by every wind of doctrine. You'll hear the right doctrine, but then someone else will come along and tell you doctrine that opposes that, and you'll go, well, I don't know, that sounds pretty good too. That is a mark of being children in the faith and not mature in the faith. It's just like kids. You can talk kids into anything, can't you? Well, nowadays they're pretty cynical, but I mean, used to be. I can remember sitting in the back seat of the car when we took a vacation. We went through Yellowstone National Park. I sat in the back seat and convinced my sister that they had left me at the park. And she listened to me, and I, she said, well, but I see you. I said, you think you see me because you're used to seeing me. I said, but I am pleading with you now, and mentally I'm communicating with you so that you will tell them to stop the car and go back and get me. Finally, she became convinced, and she looked at my dad. She went, Dad, is Mike in the car or not? And my mom looked back and went, Michael? <laughs> you know, you've all, if you had siblings, you've been there. Get that righteous look up here. When you're children, you get carried about by every wind of doctrine. It, Paula, the, the solution to that is not just to learn doctrine. The solution to that is your edification. That's when the doctrine gets built into a house that you can actually live and function out of. All right? Uh, one more. Ephesians 4.15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. It's just to grow up into him. That's the growth terminology. I'm just trying to show you that our edification has to do with us moving from uh, babies to being children to being men. It has to do with building a building, laying a foundation, and putting a house up on that foundation. And it's exactly the way God meant to do that. Now let me just kind of show you how this structure goes. And it, it's going to do like this. We're going to lay a foundation. By the way, this foundation comes in parts. Well, that's why I need to give you the outline of the book of Romans so I can show you the cornerstones of the foundation. But just for the simplification in this introduction, here is Romans to Galatians, and that's the foundation. The house, the structure of the house goes on top of that. And that is Ephesians to Colossians. The roof or the capstone, I, I don't think that's the right word, really and truly. I've heard that word before, and I, I looked that up to see what a capstone was. It really doesn't encapsulate what I'm trying to get to here. But the roof, the Bible doesn't call it the roof, you understand. But I'm just saying, the, the, the topping off of all of that is First and Second Thessalonians. 
Not because it talks about the rapture, and the rapture is the last thing that happens to us, so therefore it's the roof. Not about that at all. It's about the doctrine that starts over in 1 Thessalonians, the things that get revealed over there. Those are the things that kind of, and that, that is, folks, your edification. That is your edification. Now you say, well, what about um, for, from 1 Timothy to Philemon? What about that? What about 1 2 Timothy and Titus and Philemon? What about them? Those are the pastoral epistles that are written to show how we are supposed to function in the framework of a local assembly. Those are not the things that add to our personal edification. They add to us as we learn how to function as a corporate group of believers on this earth. What it is we're supposed to be about, what we're supposed to be involved in. And that's why my job, my job, I learn here is to make sure this gets built in you. So you're coming here. You say, well, if the pastoral epistles don't do anything for my edification, what I'm just saying is those epistles equip a pastor to be able to do that work, to bring those people unto the stature of the fullness of Christ. And that's the job that we're trying to do here. Okay, which is apparent. That's why I'm saying this is a classroom. That's what this is supposed to be. Okay. Where are we going next? Um, we did that, didn't we? Okay. Galatians. You know, we talked about that 2 Corinthians corrective doctrine, so I'm not going to talk about it anymore, but let's look at Galatians because there was a major problem working in the Galatians here. Oh, I have a principle before I do that? Yes? Okay, I'm sorry. It kind of skipped from one page to the other, and I didn't realize what I was doing. Let's read it. God has designed a specific process by which your edification will be carried out, beginning with the foundation of Romans to Galatians, Continuing with the structure of Ephesians, Colossians, capping off the structure in First and Second Thessalonians, and finishing with the proper implementation of the doctrine within the local assembly in First Timothy through Philemon. Isn't that just what I drew up on the board anyway? So I knew that where I was going, but I just didn't realize I'd put the, the principle down there. Okay, so there it is. I repeated myself. I do want you, though, because we did talk about that, and I'm almost out of time here. In fact, let me just see if I'm going to be able to finish off this point. Okay, let's, let's just do this. I know we did the structure thing, but look, Romans, Romans lays this doctrine, but it's foundational doctrine. When you get to Ephesians, you're back in doctrine, but it is the doctrine that gets built on top of what you previously got. It's added to. That structure that comes up. This is the thing that's really moving you into maturity. That's why I said we don't have any business in Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians until we get Romans to Galatians settled firmly. That foundation has to be firm. Why we're spending the time in Romans. Have you ever tried to put walls up on a concrete slab when the concrete is still wet? Big trouble. Or when the mixture wasn't right. I actually watched a church pour a slab and a kid walked out across the concrete thinking that it was dry and actually the concrete had hollowed out underneath and there was a top layer about that thick and then a space. I don't know how that happened and he just crunched through it like snow. Well, they were mad at him because he walked on it. I'm thinking better he walked on it than everybody drove their cars in it. Thing is, this, this thing has to be right. This foundation has to be right. So even though we have talked a lot about, you know, things that are out there, we're going to occupy the heavenly places, I haven't given you a lot of doctrine with that. And the reason is because we really needed to go through this doctrine first. So we're going to take the time to do that. Now I guess what I want to do is I want to finish up. We'll just do Galatians and we'll finish it up because I told you this is doctrine. Galatians, I mean, Corinthians was the reproof and now Galatians. I'll tell you, show you two verses and then we'll be done. There's the, there's the Corinthians. We read that a while ago. You're not able to bear it, neither yet are you able. And now Galatians. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ 
unto another gospel. I want to pause right here and tell you what that other gospel was. Is the gospel of the kingdom. It was the gospel of the kingdom. They didn't go to a strange gospel of some unknown God. They went back to the gospel they came out of. Gospel of the kingdom. Putting them right back under the law. You have to work. You have to do this. All right. Verse 7. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Because it's different from the gospel of the kingdom. And then Galatians 3.1. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? So the thing we're going to wind up with here on this foundation is this. You're going to get the doctrine. That's here. In 1 Corinthians, you're going to get the reproof of our daily walk and how the doctrine says that is what that's supposed to produce in us. As that building gets built, this walk conforms. And then the last thing here is... Um, What's the word? Let me think of the word I want to use to do this. You know, they were removed from the, I, I guess let's say, steadfast. When that, as that foundation gets finished off and gets done, you become steadfast in the doctrine. You don't get removed like the Galatians. They believed that thing Paul preached. They understood the gospel of Christ. And then someone came along and said, no, that's not right. You guys got removed from the truth. Isn't everybody says it's the truth, don't they? Look, in my book, when I'm writing in my book and I go, look, let me just show you what the scripture says. It dawns on me when I'm writing that. That's what everybody says. That statement doesn't mean a thing. I almost want to not put it in there because everybody says it. And everybody's got something different to say following that statement. So, here, the Galatians got removed from that. So what Paul is doing is he's laying a foundation of, here's the doctrine that forms your foundation, here's how it affects your walk, and here's how it firms you up. And I wish, in fact, let me just show you, you got your Bibles, this isn't in the, in the PowerPoint because we're going to stop right here, but let me just show you, turn to Romans 16. Show you this last verse and then we'll quit. In Romans 16, I want you, you remember in verse 11, he said, uh, to the end that you may be established. That's why he was writing to them, to get them established in the faith. And over here in Romans 16, um, 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 oh, I'm, no wonder I can't find it. I went flip pages and over to Corinthians. Okay. Romans 16, and look with me in verse 25. Now to him that is of power to, what's that word? Establish you. He starts off Romans, in Romans 1, I'm going to get you established. In Romans 16, he is a, that is a power to establish you. What did I tell you was the difference there? Stabilize. That's what this is. This thing in Galatians is meant to stabilize you. But he does that in Romans. He takes them, he says, let me get you established. And by the, end, by the time you get to the end of Romans, you should be stable. It's, I think of it like this. It's like getting a kid a new bike. Never ridden a bike. They're finally going to get a bike. Not the tricycle, the bicycle. They have a bike. That is being established. But riding that bike without crashing, that's when you are established. You, you got the difference there? That's what Romans is going to do for us. Get us established. I know you're established. Get you established and then get you stable. Once that foundation is stable, then you go into the, the meat epistles and you start putting the structure up. Good stuff. God, God is, God just, 